In the early decades of the 20th century, Kentucky was in the grips of what are now known as the Cave Wars. All throughout the state, subterranean adventurers were competing for tourist dollars by touting their own guided cave explorations in and around the region's crown jewel, Mammoth Cave. And at the height of the Kentucky Cave Wars in the 1920s, a young explorer and entrepreneur named Floyd Collins was poised to outdo the competition. He had found what he believed to be his ace in the hole, a previously undiscovered cave system hidden away on the property of a farmer right near Mammoth Cave. Collins dubbed it Sand Cave and quickly struck a deal with a property owner, Beasley Doyle, to split the profits they'd inevitably earn from untold numbers of visitors anxious to explore this underground wonderland. Collins shrewdly recognized the appeal of Sand Cave's most unique feature, a large grotto chamber that opened up and dropped about 60 feet, and the chamber was only a mere 300 feet from the cave's entrance. The passageways leading to it were tight and dangerous, but he knew that if he could clear a traversable path, Sand Cave would become known not just across the state, but across the country. Ultimately, Floyd Collins was proven right. Sand Cave did make national headlines, but the cost was his own life. While exploring the cave in January 1925 in preparation for what he was sure would be a forthcoming tide of visitors, Collins accidentally dislodged a 27-pound rock on his way out. That rock pinned his leg and trapped him inside. Collins was discovered a day later by Beasley Doyle's son, Jewel, but he couldn't be pulled out. He was alive and well, a mere 150 feet from daylight, but he was stuck and there was simply no way to get him out. Almost immediately, the news spread like wildfire, and soon enough, Sand Cave was swarming with visitors, some who had come to try and help Collins escape, others who had simply come for the spectacle. Over the next 17 days, rescuers tried with all their might to reach Floyd Collins and pull him to safety. Meanwhile, thousands of people flocked to the entrance of Sand Cave to be a part of what had become a national media spectacle, one of the very first in the era of mass communication. Radio broadcasters descended upon the cave's entrance. Vendors selling hamburgers and souvenirs set up booths. A journalist named William Skeets Burke Miller got close enough to Collins to speak with him, and conducted a series of interviews that would later earn him a Pulitzer Prize. And none other than Charles Lindbergh flew negatives of the few photos captured of the trapped Floyd Collins from the scene to newspaper offices so that they could be printed throughout a nation that was now captivated by the story of this doomed man. Unfortunately, the attempted rescue was in vain, and Floyd Collins died in Sand Cave on February 13th, 1925. But the story didn't end there. You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All It's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All It's Interesting staff writer Kleena Fraga. And I'm All It's Interesting staff writer Austin Harvey. Today, we'll be exploring the tragic and untimely death of Floyd Collins and the odd circumstances that surrounded it. Oh, come on, you young people, and listen while I tell the fate of Floyd Collins. That we all knew well His face was fair and handsome His heart was true and brave His body now lies sleeping in a lonely sandstone cave In early 20th century Kentucky, tourists were flocking to see Mammoth Cave, the world's longest known cave system comprising more than 420 miles of surveyed passageways. And farmers in the surrounding regions quickly recognized the great business opportunity that had been presented to them. Kentucky was rife with cave systems, and property owners realized they could set up guided tours of these systems to attract visitors who were on their way to Mammoth Cave. Soon enough, dozens of enterprising entrepreneurs were scouring the land in search of their own proverbial cash cow. And rival businesses popped up throughout the region, each advertising their guided tours in what was becoming a fiercely competitive market. And so the Kentucky Cave Wars were born. Among these enterprising explorers was William Floyd Collins. He was born in Logan County, Kentucky on June 20th, 1887, to a pair of farmers named Lee and Martha Jane Collins. As a child, Floyd Collins had made a hobby out of exploring the caves near his parents' farmland, farmland which happened to be not far from Mammoth Cave. His passion for cave exploration continued into adulthood, And in 1917, when Floyd Collins was 30 years old, he made a remarkable discovery. A cave system beneath his parents' property, uniquely formed of halictite and gypsum. He dubbed it Crystal Cave, 
and began work to develop it into an attraction that could draw in tourists en route to Mammoth Cave. Of course, Floyd Collins wasn't the only person to have this idea, and unfortunately, Crystal Cave's unique beauty couldn't compete with some of the other developed caves that were, frankly, easier to get to, and therefore more convenient for tourists. Luckily, Collins knew of another cave nearby, on the property of Beasley Doyle, and much closer to Cave City Road than Crystal Cave was. Travelers were sure to pass it by, and if Collins could expand the cave to allow visitors to easily navigate it, he and Doyle could turn a significant profit. Collins dubbed the cave Sand Cave and struck a deal with Doyle to split the profits. But before Collins could even get to work on expanding and developing the cave, disaster struck, and the story of Floyd Collins' Sand Cave became not the story of a successful business venture, but of a harrowing rescue attempt, and of Floyd Collins' death. How sad, how sad the story, it fills our eyes with tears. The memory still will linger for many, many years. A broken-hearted father who tried his boy to save, will now weep tears of sorrow at the door of Floyd's cave. On January 30th, 1925, Floyd Collins set out to explore Sand Cave. Armed with a single kerosene lantern, he squeezed through the cave's tight passageways, sometimes having to crawl on his stomach while nudging the lantern forward with one hand, his other arm held tight at his side so he could fit through the narrow openings. Sand Cave wasn't all tight passages, however. Collins also discovered a magnificent open space, 80 feet high, that was just 300 feet from the cave's entrance. He wanted to explore it, but because his lantern had started to flicker, Collins decided, fatefully, to turn back. As he crawled through the cave entrance, his lantern suddenly went out. Collins wasn't worried. He was an experienced cave explorer, and he knew what to do in these kinds of situations. But as he readjusted himself, Collins accidentally dislodged a 27-pound rock, which broke from the cave wall and fell right on his ankle, pinning him in place. Stuck in the narrow passageway, one arm trapped beneath him, one trapped above him, Collins could hardly move an inch. He clawed at the walls, screamed into the darkness, and struggled to free his foot. But nothing helped. No one even knew he was trapped, until the next morning when the property owner's son found Collins in the cave and sounded the alarm. Before long, dozens of locals descended on the cave entrance to help Collins, but try as they might, they couldn't get him out of the cave. Many emerged from Sand Cave shaken by the impenetrable darkness within, with one man saying, quote, I wouldn't go back in there for a cold thousand, bad as I need money, unquote. Unlike Collins, they weren't cave explorers by trade, and they didn't have his skill in navigating the passageways. Only Floyd's brother, Homer, was able to make any progress within the tunnels, but even though he could reach the trapped cave explorer, he couldn't free him, no matter how hard he tried. Meanwhile, the story of Floyd Collins had started to spread. Not only had rescuers congregated at the cave entrance, but so had scores of others, hoping to witness the liberation of the trapped cave explorer. As the crowd grew, it also came to include vendors eager to make a quick buck by selling food and drink to the growing masses, and a 21-year-old writer for the Louisville Courier Journal named William Burke Miller, who had come from 80 miles away to cover the story. His name was William, but Miller actually went by Skeets, short for Mosquito, because of his diminutive size. He weighed just 117 pounds, and it soon became clear to Miller that he might be able to squeeze through the passageways that had stumped the others. Chasing a story, Miller decided to enter Sand Cave and try to make contact with Collins. As the journalist wrote in a February 2nd dispatch, he was lowered by his ankles into the cave and then had to crawl through the tight, muddy passageways in order to reach the trapped man. Miller wrote, quote, My flashlight revealed a face on which is written suffering of many long hours, because Collins has been in agony every conscious moment since he was trapped at 10 o'clock Friday morning. I saw the purple of his lips, the pallor on his face, and realize that something must be done before long if this man is to live." Unquote. Not only was Collins suffering the torture of being trapped in the darkness, but he was driven half mad by the steady dripping of water on his face. He told Miller that he thought he would survive, though, and Miller took his hopeful words to the surface. 
Before long, Miller's coverage of Collins was picked up by the Associated Press, and word of Collins' ordeal spread across the nation. In Washington, D.C., President Calvin Coolidge and his vice president, Herbert Hoover, who had a graduate degree in geology and mining, closely followed the story. Sadly, rescue attempt after rescue attempt came to naught, even as the crowd outside the cave swelled into the tens of thousands, and as Collins' misery captured the nation's attention, his rescuers were continually stymied in their attempts to free him. On February 4th, a cave collapse made things even more difficult for both Collins and his rescuers. The trapped cave explorer cried, quote, Stay with me. Oh, please don't leave. Unquote. His rescuers had no intention of leaving him. Over the next 12 days, they continued to try and reach Collins, finally chiseling a parallel shaft into Sand Cave in hopes of extracting him alive. Sadly, by the time they penetrated the cave on February 16th, they found Collins dead. His rescuers stated, quote, No sound came from Collins at all, no respiration, no movement, and the eyes were sunken, indicating, according to physicians, extreme exhaustion going with starvation. Unquote. Collins had been trapped underground for 17 excruciating days, 12 of which were without food or water. Doctors estimated that he died between one and five days before his rescuers breached the cave wall, which means that Collins probably expired around the same time that the light bulb his rescuers gave him had finally flickered out. With the main character in the tragic saga gone, Floyd Collins' story might have ended there. Instead, it took a bizarre, morbid turn. Oh, mama, don't you worry, dear father, don't be sad. I'll tell you all my story in an awful dream I had. I dreamed I was a prisoner, my life I could not save. I cried, oh, must I perish within this silent cave. In a sign of things to come, Floyd Collins wasn't allowed to rest in peace for very long. His rescuers decided to leave his body in Sand Cave, as extracting it would be too dangerous, and the man who owned the property where Sand Cave was located decided to capitalize on its infamy. He erected a sign on the highway nearby which read, quote, 200 yards away, the body of Floyd Collins is imprisoned in Sand Cave, unquote, and charged curious travelers 50 cents for the opportunity to stare into the dark abyss that had swallowed Collins. A few months later, his brother Homer was able to raise enough money by sharing the story of what had happened to Floyd to finally retrieve his corpse. But though Collins was briefly put to rest on the family property, his body was exhumed in 1927. The Collins family had been forced to sell their farm, and the man who purchased it, Harry B. Thomas, promptly dug up Collins' body, stuck it in a glass coffin, and put it on display at nearby Crystal Cave. Even after his death, Floyd Collins continued to draw crowds, and tourists came by the dozens to gaze upon the corpse of the quote-unquote greatest cave explorer ever known. Among the curious were also thieves, and several people attempted, with varying degrees of success, to steal Collins' corpse out of its glass coffin. In 1961, the U.S. government purchased Crystal Cave and stopped the flow of visitors. More than two decades later, Collins' body was finally removed, and, at long last, laid to rest at a nearby church. Nearby, Sand Cave was welded shut with a steel door. Today, Sand Cave is a quiet place. Located in Mammoth Cave National Park, but disconnected from the caves themselves, Sand Cave is easily overlooked. There's no sign of the tens of thousands of people who once descended upon the area, no reminder of the intrepid reporter or the determined rescuers, and certainly no indication that in 1925, the cave became Floyd Collins's tomb. The story of Floyd Collins and his entrapment at Sand Cave. Mm. Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? It is, and it's such a weird story. Less so the getting trapped part. Hmm. Everything that happened after yeah, is what really right. weirds me out. <laughs> it's true. It's like a story in three acts of like getting trapped, the rescue, and then the really weird final chapter. I can't imagine wanting to steal someone's body. No. 
I can yeah. understand it. I have to be careful the way I say this. I can understand <laughs> grave robbing. Uh huh. <laughs> like, um, from you know, uh, from a certain perspective, if someone's buried with their valuables, they don't need them anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Is the logic for grave robbers? Not saying I would ever do it. Not saying I have done it. Uh huh. That's what they all but, say. But, <laughs> but <laughs> it makes sense to me to some degree. This mm-hmm. stealing just a person's body is weird. It's very strange. It's like the kind of thing where when people see something like on display or something that's been, I don't know, amplified somehow, they're like, I must have that. I must disturb this thing. Some weird human compulsion. It's that rebelliousness of like a red line you cannot cross or something that says, don't, you know, don't touch the wet paint. And you're like, well, I'm going to touch that paint. It's um, well, what's that called? Intrusive yeah. thoughts. It's like their <laughs> intrusive thoughts took over. As a kid, I would have like my Game Boy sitting in the back seat, and I would like want to hold it out the window. And I was like, I know what's going to happen is the wind's going to take it. I'm going to drop it. And now I'm not going to have a Game Boy. I don't want to do this. Why am I thinking about it? <laughs> well, better that than uh, looking at a person in a glass coffin and being like, hmm, I could I steal this that. guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. Just the whole thing is just like touching the body and like carrying it. And someone actually did yeah. carry it out and got, right. got kind of far with it. Yeah. And then Floyd Collins' body lost a leg. So yeah, ugh. it's very bizarre. I, I'm regretful that at least from what I found, I couldn't actually find like I wanted someone to interview the guy who stole the body. Right. <laughs> Yeah, what's his story? They kind of just gloss over that in a lot of the historical accounts where it's just like, and then the body was stolen, and then it was returned. It's like, well, hold on. Yeah. Wait a second. Let's talk to this guy. Let's figure out what's going on here. I wonder if there was something, like, if someone wanted to make money off of it, like, they wanted to put it in, like, the circus or some sort of, like, sideshow. Like, this is Floyd Collins' body. and Right. You know? Or, yeah, set up their own little, like, museum kind of deal. Yeah. Like a hustler. Like, just like, hey, come check it out. I got the body. You know, there was um a conspiracy theory that John Wilkes Booth didn't die after he killed Lincoln, that he wasn't killed by Union soldiers, and that he died much, much later, and then his body was in, like, a sideshow in, like, a circus. And you could come, like, see it. And there's, like, photos of this person who is... Not Booth, but they said it was Booth that people could come and just kind of look upon. So there's a whole industry about these things, or there was. I mean, I guess we do the same thing like we were talking about the last time we recorded with King Tut. Like, Mm. we go to museums, we look at... I I mean, we're essentially just looking at dead bodies. Yeah, that's true. I mean... Probably not most of the time. I don't think they actually have the bodies. It's probably like a like how they don't actually have dinosaur bones. It's just like a mold. Yeah, but it's like this sort of not morbid curiosity. Well, I guess it is pretty morbid. (laughs) Body that's morbid. I think like King Ted is like not as morbid. It's like more history, right? It can be both. I guess it can be both. I thought the interesting thing about this was just how fast the story spread and how many people came to like yeah. try to bear witness to it. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I think the National Guard said like as many as like fifty thousand people at one point might have wow. been hanging out there at the cave entrance. That's insane. The- that's like a modern day sporting event. Yeah, it is. It just really captivated yeah. like the nation's attention. I think stuff like that for um, like the two weeks that this was taking place, it was so important. And then since then, it's just no one's really heard of it. Right. Since then, it's sort of a fascinating thing. It does feel like something that should be taught given. Uh, oh, what was the journalist name? Why am I blanking on this? Skeets. Miller. Skeets. Skeets Miller. Yeah. Given how prominent his involvement was and the fact that it won him a Pulitzer Prize conducting these interviews, I think it's a really good to be able to just share the story as a passive observer of it rather yeah. than like editorializing and I think Miller did sort of, you know, he was involved in like rescue stuff and he did, um, I think, put a lot of emotion into his dispatches. But he ultimately, yeah, it was he wasn't like they should be doing this or like this is what's not working. It was more, you know, these like very tragic like dispatches about Floyd Collins thinking he would get out or dreaming of angels right. or anything like that was. And also, you know, radio was brand new at the time or newish. And so these stories were spreading like they had never mm-hmm. spread before. People suddenly had an instant updates and stuff about what was going on. Poor yeah, sort of the first, the first time anyone could ever really do that was, mm-hmm. like, which is so in a modern context, funny to think about because this is, I mean, we're 100 years removed. So yeah, in that 100 years, how we went from news, not necessarily being new right like you would have like you'd hear the news or you'd read the news but it would be like a couple days after that event 
happened because of the way the process was yeah. to then sort of instantaneous with the radio and with um, stories like this being able to spread. And now it's like you can't escape the news. Yeah. But that makes me wonder if like if Floyd Collins, because there have been in the past couple of years, even these like cave rescues, like there was that mm-hmm. Thai soccer team and stuff. And I wonder if there had been people like, I don't know, like TikToking or like Instagramming the rescue stuff. This would have had so much attention and like the news media would have descended on the cave. And would that because it seemed like like everyone was paying attention to this, but it wasn't like the government was like, oh, we we have to get involved because people are yelling at right. us on Twitter or something. You know, there was like the, the locals were trying to help. And then the I think the Kentucky National Guard came in at one point, but they it was like they were either like cave experts or they were organized and they like weren't both. There was no one who could like, come in and really like make anything happen in the end. And right, I wonder if, yeah. if they if that would have been like different today, if they could have succeeded in rescuing him. Yeah, I'm really curious about that, too. I'm curious if even just modern technology would have allowed him to be rescued because mm. it was pretty much that one rock trapping him. Right. I know there was like a lot of nuance with the layout of the cave and that played a big role as well. But yeah, it'd be re- it'd be really interesting to see a similar situation because he was close enough to the entrance of the cave, obviously, that people were able to go and talk to him and. You know, you, in broad daylight, you could see where he was versus some of these other cave stories where people are trapped like miles underground or whatever. Mm-hmm. It'd be so interesting in a modern context. Would Floyd Collins just be tweeting or like on Instagram live <laughs> while he's laying there like, hey, guys, what up? Got trapped. Yeah, he could have been. If like, he had his phone with him, I guess he could have been Yeah, tweeting in theory. Yeah. I don't know what like when I read about this cave, it seems like. You know, it wasn't like just a cave with like stone walls. A lot of it was like muddy and mm. like water dripping and people would go down to try to help him. But they just get so freaked out by the walls were like crumbling a little. It just sounds horrible. But yeah, I feel like modern day technology might have there could be like heat scans to know exactly where he was. And right. Yeah, he. I think he might have survived if he'd gotten trapped 100 years after he got trapped. Yeah, definitely. It is a really fascinating little hidden I don't want to say gem, but hidden story in history. Well, I I pitched this story originally because my friend told me about it and I'd never heard of it before. And I'm pretty sure he heard about it because he's really into musical theater. And this was a musical in the 90s. And so I was looking in. Yeah, (laughs) I was looking into how this guy it kind of reminded me, you know, of Hamilton a little. Not that Hamilton's like an unknown figure in American history, but just sort of elevating unknown parts of his life. Um, And so I looked up how they found out about Floyd Collins and the writer of the music and the writer of the script. Like they just found like one paragraph about the media carnival that like ensued might have been just like a sentence. And they're like, huh, that's really interesting. Like, let's learn more about that. And then that developed in this whole like actual play. I thought that was interesting that it took one little sentence and then they were they were like, let's find out what this story is and write it. What a a strange subject to make a musical. about. (laughs) Yeah, very. I know. Have you you seen the musical? Mm -mm, I haven't. I'm so curious now. Oh, you can hear the music (laughs) online. The Ballad of Floyd Collins. Oh, nice. <laughs> Ooh, it's like folky. It's very, you know, like those old like finger picked guitar, like nylon string, mm-hmm. like yeah. like it kind of like around a campfire, like very, yeah, like almost Western, but it's very slow and melancholy. <laughs> well, it's a very melancholy <laughs> type yeah. story, I suppose. I'm yeah. really curious about seeing this musical now. <laughs> I mean, it was in the 90s and I saw online it said it was only like 25 performances or something. Like not very many anyway. And I think it was off Broadway. But yeah. I wonder if there's any recordings of it or anything out there. Maybe on YouTube or I don't know. Yeah. I, or like an amateur theater production of it. Yeah. Right. Later performances. Yeah. I mean, the other weird thing about Floyd Collins too, or not weird, but unsettling, I guess, is that he's just like not the only person to ever get trapped in a cave and die horribly. Like it happens. I want to say a fair amount, but it happens. Like it's yeah. not unheard of. I was trying to do some research about like other awful <laughs> cave deaths and a lot of them are Uh, water caves like people swimming somewhere and then just getting trapped which seems like the worst way to go to me um that always freaked me out in movies like adventure Mm -hmm. movies where people are like in a cave and they have to swim through like a part that goes i'm like you don't like Like, know where that's going like this seems it's so scary to me so scary did you ever see um that horror movie the descent no oh it's about this group of girls who go spelunking Mm -hmm. at a cave they're not supposed to be in and then they encounter these like offshoot humans who have been living in the darkness and are can't it's a very scary movie that sounds really scary it takes like the that like 
very claustrophobic. You have to have flare light and like minimal flashlight kind of. And then it throws the monsters in and it's like, oh, mm, <laughs> um, yeah, it's not something I would ever want to do. Uh, me neither. Yeah, I was going to ask if you had ever gone cave exploring or if you wanted to at all. I've gone through like like cave tours. OK, Um, what's uh, what's the one around here? Laurel Caverns. I went to the Laurel Caverns, mm-hmm. um, which is one of those like they have a path with it's roped off and you can walk through. It was it was a long walk and it was very cold. It was like the middle of the summer, but I was freezing in the cave. Mm. And then they did that thing where they like walked us into a chamber and then shut off all the lights so you could oh, see how God. dark it was. And I was like, Ugh. yeah, I, I was holding my hand like literally inches from my face. I, like, I can't see anything. Wow. I, I read um some testimonies of people who tried to rescue Floyd Collins and they because it was so dark, they would have this like warped sense of time. Like this one guy went down and he was down there for like 15 minutes and he came out and thought it had been two hours because it was so dark and he just like your body's not used to it your mind i don't know yeah Um, and then yeah i'd imagine like at a certain point you start seeing shapes in the whatever yeah yeah. mind starts i'm sure your other senses are heightened and sure it's so scary your mind races i mean i guess the other we wanted to talk about like the nutty putty cave story as well which is sort of a similar awful cave it's it's this guy who got stuck in a cave in Utah, and it's sort of like Floyd Collins. I don't know how, how well you know this story or not, but he got stuck in a very narrow passage. He, he took a wrong oh, turn. Yeah. He got into a place, part of the cave where you weren't supposed to go, and got really stuck. And I think he was upside down. Oh, and they did they never get his body out? No, they sealed off the caves. Wow. He's still there. I know. Oh, that's, yeah. So it's just, it's not a cave. It's a grave now. That's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- that story and this story are the kind of things from like, you know, Mother Nature, you got to be got to be careful. There's a reason that we're not blind super sonar mammals like bats. Right. Yeah. I read one anecdote that I guess like the darkness in Kentucky caves is so intense that like fish in like the water don't have eyes, I think. Oh, they don't, yeah. They just don't need them. It's that dark. Right. Are those the same fish that are also like basically translucent because light never hits them um, maybe I'm i don't know it's like like deep ocean else. type fish yeah i'd imagine there's yeah. not that much different because like if you're not, not being touched by sunlight what do you need to have skin that blocks it from like, yeah Ugh. yeah that's the monsters in the descent i say mo- they're humans who lived in these caves they're blind and pale and as a kid i used to go to um cedar point a lot my family would always stop at putin bay on the way and putin bay is on lake erie Mm-hmm. And it's a, just like a small little island, but they have a good amount of stuff to do. They do have caves you can go into, but they're all like crystal caves. And so I used to, as a kid, like we would always go and walk through and I'd be like, ooh, pretty mm-hmm. shiny. And then I'd buy a geode from the gift shop at the end and stuff. I used to be really, really fascinated by rocks and crystals and gemstones. Oh, um, wow. But yeah, I'd, it kind of faded with time. And then I used to rock climb a good bit. I got nervous doing it you know out in the sky in the air can't imagine like spelunking which is sort of just inverse Mm -hmm. rock climbing you're going down into dark that is so terrible no it sounds horrible to me i have not ever gone cave exploring i don't think i ever will maybe like the entrance i'll go like one step inside but i wouldn't go like deep down into a cave yeah Yeah, or, or like abandoned mines you ever go through like one of those old mine tours no, there was like um in my hometown there's abandoned like barracks from I think I guess from like World War Two. They're really creepy because they're like big cement, they're underground and everyone's like painting them with graffiti. I think that's the closest I've gotten to anything mine or cave related. I do recommend doing it at least once. Really? If you can find like if you can find like a small cave, one where you book an appointment and like have a mm. tour guide. Not like I'm not just suggesting people go wandering into caves. That's a bad idea. Yeah, but I do think it's a really unique experience because like you said about time warping and stuff, even like I think it was like maybe three minutes we sat there with the lights off and it was like Mm. it felt like a really long time. It's super freaky, but it kind of puts a lot of stuff into perspective also where you're like, it's it's so hard to describe unless you've like experienced it, but it is it's a really unique experience. I think everyone should do Hmm. at least one time. I could see doing it like, yeah, like a cave and not like a tunnel like what Floyd Collins had and having other people right. with me, I could see doing. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you can do it around Halloween, do like a haunted. <laughs> <movie>. <laughs> well, 
uh, I don't know about that one. But I did yeah. one of those this past year, and that was that was also very scary. Oh man, yeah, I don't know. Darkness and enclosed spaces are probably not my favorite thing in the world. No, I don't think they should be. I think those are two no. like primal, <laughs> primal fears. Right. Yeah, I think that's true. I think honestly, genuinely, the biggest impact of this story was the way it influenced or changed or showed the prominence of this kind of new media. Mm. The way that yeah. news could spread, the fascination, the spectating of it all is like the story of Floyd Collins as a man, as the, you know, the Sand Cave incident mm -hmm. is fairly straightforward. It's still interesting, but the, I think the more interesting aspect of it is everything around it. Yeah. And the way that that has like affected how stories are told and shared. Yeah, just this this moment in time that captures so much about, yeah, media and information. And I mean, I, I'll, I'll say it again. I think things like this that, you know, for two weeks captivated the nation's attention and then just yeah, we'll move on to the next thing. Right. And we forget about these stories, but they're they're really fascinating to um, revisit. Yeah. Even the lead up to it with just the discovery of Mammoth Cave and the way that people mm. try to capitalize on that. The cave wars and everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like it. That like competitive capitalist entrepreneurial like, oh, we got to get in on this while we can. You can see a lot of parallels to that in different forms still recently, like can look at like NFTs mm, where right. it was this sort of massive craze in this very unregulated space that a lot of people tried to take advantage of and then. In a lot of instances, it didn't turn out well. Mm -hmm. And that's like sort of the same thing you get like in the cave wars where it's like, OK, well, I'm not a, a professional. I'm not equipped to go and explore these caves. I just happen to have one in my backyard. And so let's mm -hmm. make it into a business. And then you have something happen like this where it's this big national spectacle that ends in tragedy. Yeah, it definitely. I mean, I can see why it would work as a play because it has all these, you know, great Themes, like you said, of capitalism and um, also just, you know, there's Floyd Collins, his brother is trying to rescue him the whole time. This reporter comes in. He's like small enough to fit in the cave. Like it's a lot of and of course, as we said, the ending of his body and it's weird. Fate. Right. Yeah. It's a lot Which of stuff going like, on. Yeah. The body thing really should have been covered more. I stand by that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a weird thing to be like, let's get in the car and go see Floyd Collins yeah. body in Crystal Cave. Hmm. Well, it's still mm -hmm. there, right? Like you can go to no. this day. Or is it not okay? I couldn't. No, remember. they they buried it um in a churchyard. The government bought the property, and so right. it's a park now, and so it's, it's buried in a church nearby, or yeah, yeah. a okay. graveyard, okay. which is good. Probably you know Floyd Collins would probably be happy not being in a cave <laughs> the rest of his <laughs> life to getting trapped in one. Yeah, though he did like caves a lot. So I, he did like caves. That's true. <laughs> that is true. Deep in the land. Of the hollows and creeks If and you get lost You get lost for weeks Listen to the tale of a man Who got lost A hundred feet under the winter frost Now Floyd was a reasoning man He knew what he wanted And he had a plan He was just as smart as he was brave He was gonna find him That wraps up our discussion on Floyd Collins. Uh, we'll be back on March 22nd with another discussion episode about the Isdal woman, who was this woman whose body was discovered in Norway, um, I believe in the 70s. And people think she might have been some kind of spy. She had like a bunch of passports on her. She died very mysteriously. No one knows who she is. So that should be a good one coming up next. Yeah, that is bound to be an interesting episode because yeah. that case is bizarre. So weird. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you don't miss that episode. And if you want to dive deeper into any of the stories we've covered today in the past or will be covering in the future, be sure to check out all that's interesting dot com history revealed on Facebook. And you can find us on Instagram and take uh, and, and you can find us on Instagram and TikTok at real history uncovered be sure to leave a rating and a comment if you enjoyed the show and we'll see you guys later see you guys later mm -hmm.